Good evening, everybody. I'm going to make uh, the presentation of Juan Carlos. It's meant to be very formal, but uh, uh, we're very good friends for quite some time, and uh, I really appreciate that he's joining us here. Uh, he traveled from Mexico City all the way here, but I understand that he's a very, very busy person in Mexico. Um, Juan Carlos is a very successful architect in Mexico. He's been doing an amazing career down there, and, uh, and we're very excited to hear how and why he's been getting there. Um, he created kind of like a very particular formula in which uh, he's uh, combining issues of sustainability with uh, the cooperative kind of like world. And now his office is even running uh, kind of over offices like HOK or other ones, uh, and getting them more work than what they've been doing. So he's growing like in a very dramatic way. And, uh, and that's something that we gotta learn from him that he's extremely successful in that. Juan Carlos uh, was born and raised in Mexico City and uh, he attended uh, school, uh, he did his professional degree in the uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico as an architect. And he also got some graduate studies uh, abroad, one which we, we went together in uh, Berkeley in contemporary uh, arts. And then he got other studies in interiors at uh, Domus in Milano and uh, a few other ones. I know that he went as well to Harvard or you know, kind of course like not that long ago and so um, uh, He's been lecturing uh, all around the world. I mean, recently he was in Amsterdam and he was in China as well, giving you know, all the lectures. And, uh, and he's been kind of awarded as well with kind of like important awards uh, in Mexico and abroad as well. Uh, so, uh, some of those awards that I can mention, uh, the one for Efficient Power, which uh, I was very happy that he was invited for a Royal Surpriser, uh, which he got uh, the prize as a uh, uh, commended future project tall building by MIPIM, uh, Architectural Review in Cannes, France, 2009. Uh, among other kind of like uh, uh, awards that I can mention is the Benin Quest for Best Corporate Space. Icons of Design, Architectural Gadgets in Mexico 2008, and uh, etc. The Best Sustainable Projects by MIDI, the uh, Mexican Association of Interior Designers 2008, etc. etc. Now, there's multiple kind of like awards, and he continues kind of like getting a lot of awards. Uh, I think he really kind of like is connecting sustainability with cooperative, cooperative spaces, and that's something that we really, really need to kind of get attention to. Another thing that uh, he's very challenging on is that um, he started with a formula which uh, he designs from the inside out. And uh, he starts from a cell, a particular kind of space on those cooperative offices and it starts spreading out into the building itself. Well, I don't want to talk more, but uh, 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 it's kind of like that. Uh, um, let's kind of have him, give him a good welcome here. Hmm? <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as I do in almost all my lectures, I'm going to have to take a picture for Twitter. Because if, if it's not in Twitter, it didn't happen. So now I can start. The good thing of having a thick accent like, like I do is that people, when I sp did give this type of lectures in English, people tend to with more attention because otherwise they just don't understand what I'm saying. So that's, that's something very good in, in this type of forums. Uh, when, I was, when I was a student and I, I used to went to, to a lot of lectures, uh, many of those lectures were kind of depressing uh, because architects, we always tend to have a very, very big ego and we ended up talking only about the good things that we do and the amazing designers that we are and the beautiful projects that we do. And, and I wanted to know what was behind the beautiful projects because if you want to see the beautiful projects, you go to the magazine or, or you go to the internet and you see them. But I, I always was at hoping that somebody gonna, was going to start talking about what they were thinking before the design. Uh, the, the way they understand the world, what they think for the future, th something that can give me some tools or some idea of, of where the, the world is going. So all my lectures have been trying to, to, to go that way. 
And this one specifically, uh, uh, I finished uh, a lecture in New York and some people came to me and asked me to, to give a, a, a lecture in, in Taipei. And even without knowing the, the theme or anything else, I said, yes, I, I love to travel and if it's for free, I'm, I'm in. So I didn't really know what it was about or anything like that, but I said, yeah, sign me in and I, I will talk about whatever you want me. So basically, a few days later, they told me, well, the way we're going to set up this, this lecture or this Congress is going to be divided in three pieces. And they wanted to do the, the, the biggest interdisciplinary Congress in the world. And they decided to do it in, in, in China, in, specifically in Taipei. And the, the idea was to, to bring somebody to talk about something that was going on in the world and then bring designers, graphic designers, industrial designers, any type of designers to talk about that specific theme. And the, the, the thing that they decided that I, I needed to talk about was uh, migrations and many like physical migrations, how people is moving around the world and how that is affecting the design and, and, and our industry. And I really don't know anything about migrations and don't care that much anyway. So I decided to do my lecturing in something else. So, but it was based on migration. So I put the word migration so they didn't get upset. <laughs> What I actually did was put together many of the things that I was thinking that was important in, in the way we, we do work. And at the end, I ended up realizing that what I did was to, to give meaning to, to, to what I do in my, in my office and to give meaning to many of the, of the strategies that we have and, and, the, and, and the design that we do. Before I start uh, directly to, with, with the lecture, I always wanted to leave one, one, one question in the air before I start the lecture, and I, I hope I, I can answer that question after the lecture. And since I was little, I, I always loved cars, and I'm, I'm a car guy. I collect, I race, I, I love cars, whatever has to do with cars. And when, when I had like probably 10 years old, I remember looking into the, the cars made on the 60s and saying, well, I wanted to be the year 2000, because if the cars made in the 60s can do what they can do, a Shelby, a Porsche, whatever you want, you name it, uh, even Nissan, if they can do what they can do, well, in the 2000, they're going to fly. They, they, they're going to go to the moon. Gonna, it's it's going to be an industry, a beautiful industry. It's going to be amazing. And then the year, the year 2000 came, and I look around and I say, well, maybe we have to give them a little more time, maybe 10 years more. And then the 10 years pass, and you look around the car industry today, and it's crap. If you want to have a car that is, that is going to be worth it to, to, to collect, you have to spend $100,000. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to buy anything that is worth it to, to sit down 40 years and give it to your son or your, or your daughter. And my question is, what the hell happened with that industry? What happened with an industry that was doing amazing designs with an amazing performance in the 60s, and it came to, to what we have today. And as you will see in the lecture, I tend to oversimplify many things, and I'm, I'm going to oversimplify a few to, to make sense of what I'm, what I'm going to try to explain. Going back to the lecture, uh, to, to begin with, uh, I, I try to understand where we are and, and, and why the world is what it is today. I'm basically oversimplifying. Where we are is in a world that is a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. That's it. That's, we can oversimplify our living, our economics, our education system, our societies, even the way that the cities are built in Europe, for example, you can know where the poor people is and where the rich people is, depending on the, how the air gets into the city. Because when the factories were built, they put the factories in a way that the rich people was not going to smell the, the fumes from the factory. So today, you, you can make sense of, of Paris, or you can make sense of, of Berlin and London, basically based on the way the air gets into the city. But it's not only that. It's everything that surrounds us is a, is a consequence of, of the last big revolution. I don't think we have a, another big revolution in between after the Industrial Revolution. And I don't think that technology by itself is a revolution. But what is the problem with that revolution? 
The problem with that revolution is that for 150 years, we built a world around one type of thinking, logical, sequential, mathematical. Basically, what we did is we have been building a, a, a specific or, or a complete world, an educational system, economies, the politics, everything around one way of thinking. And basically, is the, the left brain. And, and as probably you all know, we have two hemispheres on the brain. One is uh, logical, mathematical, sequential, and the other one is empathic, it's a mess, it's colorful, it's emotional. And the, 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 the right brain, the emotional, the colorful, uh, is the one that everybody has been telling us for years that don't use that one to make decisions, don't be irrational, be rational, don't, don't jump into conclusions, etc., etc., etc. The problem is that we have been doing everything to build a world around one specific way of thinking. Uh, I have a few friends uh, that uh, when they were young, one of them decided that he wanted to be a graphic designer. And he decided to, to, to brought it out when he was having lunch in, with, with his family. And everybody was freaking out. And, the, and his father told him that if, if he wanted to, to buy him a tutu, you know, the little dress for, for ballet, because the, his father thought that the, that was outrageous that somebody wanted to, 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 to study graphic design. And he was very concerned that graphic designers don't make enough money, so he was going to have to pay for the rest of his life, for the life of his kid. And he went out and studied graphic design anyway. But that is like an example of how a few years ago, one type of thinking, the, 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 the left brain, the emotional, the creative part of the, of the brain, was analyzed uh, for the rest of the world. And in that time, normally what, what people will say is, if you go and study something rational, sequential, mathematical, linear, you're going to be doing well. If you are an accountant, if you are a lawyer, if you are an engineer, a doctor, those things pay, those things are going to make you successful. Don't be a painter, don't be a designer, don't be a musician, because you're going to end up poor, crazy, and lonely. And, they have, and, and the thing is that this has been an idea for 150 years, and it worked. It worked for a lot of people. A lot of people made a lot of money. Corporations get bigger and bigger, and, and we have been destroying the planet systematically, mainly because of that. Uh, and, and, and in many things, it worked. But I believe that there are four, many four reasons that are going to transform that reality, and those reasons are going to create the next revolution, the next real big revolution. The first one is outsourcing. Today, uh, the, the percentage of the accounting that is done in the States for Americans is very little. I don't know if you know that, but, but it's around 70% of the accounting in the state is done in India. By somebody that is probably in a basement getting paid with like a, a quarter, or I don't know how much they're getting paid, but it's, people don't do accounting in the States almost anymore. If you study one of those things that were logical, mathematical, and sequential, those things can be outsourced. And those things are being outsourced right now. There's going to be millions of works that are going to move from the States and from Europe into China and India to be outsourced. The second force that is going to transform our reality is abundance. And abundance has probably two, two phases. The first problem of, of abundance is that we have way too many things that we don't really need. So we are using resources from many places to create things that we really don't need. And an example of this is the, the self-storage uh, industry that you probably all know. In the States, the self-storage industry makes more money than the movies. When you, when you have an industry that stores things that you don't need that you don't want, but you bought and you don't want to get rid of, makes more money of the biggest entertainment industry in the world, there's something wrong there. I mean, it doesn't make sense. 
But the second part, the second phase of, the, of abundance, that is probably the, the biggest problem, is that we are creating crap. And, I mean, look around, not specifically here, but in your life. And I don't have a bottle of, of water, but I, normally I have a bottle of water that is a very good example of, of the biggest problem with abundance. We are creating things that doesn't mean anything to us, that doesn't relate emotionally to us. That's why they become garbage very easily, because they don't connect to us, we don't, they, they don't matter. And they are poorly designed, poorly manufactured, and they become way too fast into, into garbage. What the, the example of the bottle of water is a very good one, because a bottle of water has two lives. The first part of his life is going to be a bottle of water. The second part is going to be garbage. The first part of his life, of the life of the bottle, is in, it may last between five or six months, tops. I mean, from the time that it was produced to the time that you drink the water, I don't think that that is, is, is going to be more than six months. And then that bottle of water is going to stay in the planet for 150 years. Who was the genius that decided that that was a bottle of water? That is not a bottle of water. That is something else. That's got to be something else because it's going to be only six months bottle of water, and then it's going to be only, then it's going to be 150 years something else. Why, why we are still considering a bottle of water, designing it as a bottle of water, instead of asking us, what the hell is the other thing that is going to be in the planet? And maybe it should be a brick. Maybe it should have a, the, the shape of a brick, so once you end up drinking the water, you can put sand on it and build a house or do something that makes sense to, to have for 150 years. But it doesn't make sense to have the X bo bottle of water for 160 years, or 200 years. That's the biggest problem with abundance, that we are not asking the right questions when we do things, when we do design objects. We are asking the wrong questions and then we are producing a lot of things. And because we are in this society that is the consequence of the Industrial Revolution, we are much more concerned that that thing is, very, is being produced very well, very fast, uh, consuming little energy, and so on. But the first question at the beginning, what do we really want to do? That was not asked at the beginning, so you never, you never know really what you're doing. The third uh, force on, on, on this is the demographic change. And, the, in, and again, the demographic change has a few, a few phases, but one of them is there's people that is around the 40s that they are having kids right now. And basically the people that is around the 40s, 50s, and, and some older, is a generation of, of people that is frustrated. Uh, the last res, uh, research that I read about that said that 70% of the people in a, work in a, in a company, in, a, in, the, in the workplace, doesn't like what they do and they are not engaged and they basically 30% of that hate their job and the other one just don't like it. There's only 30% if you are lucky of the people that is working in today in the workplace environment that they actually like what they do. And there's like 5% of those that they are passionate about what they do. So basically we have 95% of people working outside there that they are not passionate about what they do. And this is, this is, this is really sad in one hand, but it's, it's a huge problem in the other one, because we are not going to be able to solve the problems that we need to solve as a society with people that is not passionate about what they do. And that has to do a lot with, the, with education. There's a book, and I'm going to talk about a little more about, it, about that book, but it's called the, the Element, and I don't know if you have read about it. But it's an English guy, Ken Robinson, and, and if you haven't read about it, probably you, you have seen his video. He's, he has a record on, on uh, TED. I don't know how many million li the likes and clicks or whatever. And basically he's, he's criticizing the, the educational system because what he's, he did is he did a study of I don't know how many people, successful people, to try to understand why they were successful. 
And the other thing that they, they and some of them were short, the other ones were tall, some were fat, another skinny. Nothing was like he couldn't find a uh, something a pattern. The only thing that he found is that there are two things that they had in common. They found very early in their life what was their passion, and they found very early in their life in what they were a little better than everybody else. And if you match, if you can, are able to, to match the, those two things and find the place in between, he calls them the element. But if you live in the element, you're successful. You're going to be successful. It doesn't matter why. What? If you find your passion and you find what, in, what are you a little better than everybody else, you're going to be, the sky is the limit. And finding your passion has, has another good consequence. It gives you peace of mind. Once that you know why you, you are here in the world, what's the meaning of being here, sitting down here, listening to, to this Mexican with thick accent? If you find out why you are here, it gives you peace of mind. It's like everything else is, is nicer then. The, the challenge with uh, demographic change is that finally we are starting to, to educate kids with that idea. All the people, a lot of people from my generation are starting to educate their kids, trying to find or help them find what is their passion. And if their passion is to play violin, well, let's play violin. Something that didn't happen in, in, in other generations, for sure didn't happen in my generation. But what's going to happen with that? We, in a few years, we can have that generation getting into the workplace environment. And some, some authors, they say that they, in 2020, there are going to be five generations in, in the workplace. And that's going to be a complete design challenge for, for whoever decided to, to go into workplace design or even to, to, to manage a company. To manage five generations in the same space is going to be a huge challenge because the things that move you, what, what it makes you do, what, what, what you want to do in one generation are very different to another generation. But what is going to happen is that this new generation is going to go to the workplace and it's going to kill the other generations because they're going to have passion, something that is, you don't find so easily today. The next uh, force that, that I believe that is changing our world is technology. And some people believe that technology by itself is a, is a, is a revolution. But I really believe that it's a tool that is part of a bigger revolution. And what happened with oversimplifying again? What happened with, with technology 60 years ago? When somebody decided that they needed to do technology, you basically had a few options. Everybody wanted to do a technology that, that imitates the brain. Otherwise, why do you do a technology? So when you started to do these technologies, well, you have basically two options. Do we do a technology that imitates the, the logical sequential brain that is the, in that moment the, the successful one? Or you want to do a technology that is empathic, that is uh, emotional, that is like, no way, don't do that one. Why do you want to do a technology that is empathical, emotional, and all the things that you should be doing? So everybody focused on doing technologies that imitated the left brain very successfully. Today, any computer can, can, can uh, sort for data or uh, uh, yeah, basically uh, do what, what the left brain does faster than the left brain. And a few years ago, finally, a computer uh, won in a chess match against Kasparov, something that people never thought it was possible because it's, it's not only data, what, what you have in a match, in a chess match, it's, it's strategy. So how can a computer can be beating a human being on strategy? Well, it's been done. But if you ask a computer to recognize a face, it will take weeks. Basically because that's not in the left brain, that's in the right brain. And we do it very fast, but it's one part of the brain that, that the technology never imitated. So my conclusion with these forces is that if you were one of those companies, people, countries that decided to, to bet everything into the 150 years of history 
that we have on this type of world, sequential, logical, mathematical. Either a Chinese is going to take your job, or a guy in India in a basement, or the companies that you may be able to work are going to disappear. Because if you think that we're going to be able to keep producing crap eternally, you're wrong. The companies that are, that are producing things that doesn't matter, that don't, have, that don't, that don't connect emotionally with the users, are going to disappear. And we're going to start looking into more companies that, do, that are doing these type of things. We are going to start looking into more companies being more empathical and more like a Apple, for example. It's, it's going to be the new standard. So if you don't lose your job against a Chinese, you're going to lose your job because the company disappeared because it was doing only crap. Or you're going to lose your job because it's going to be like this 20-year-old guy that is going to get into the uh, workplace with passion to do the same things that you do. But the difference is that he's going to have passion and that's going to be a huge difference. Or simply, a, a computer is going to be doing what you could be doing. So the people that bet into this system that worked for 150 years, I think that is going to be very soon in, in very big problems. What is what I believe that is going to happen? It's what I call the mental migration. And this is where I force the, the word on migration. I needed to to talk about migrations in this lecture. So I, this is where I put it. But basically what is going to happen is we're going to have to jump from a logical, analytical, fact-based world to a holistic, intuitive, integrated, and sensitizing world. And this is not going to be easy because we have been told not to do those things for many years. We have been told to be logical, not to make emotional decisions. There's, there's, a, there's a book, Blink, I don't know if you have read it, that talks about uh, uh, what happens in the brain when you have this feeling that something is wrong. No? Uh, uh, the, uh, I forgot the word in, in, in English. But it's, it's uh, when, you know, when you don't have like, the, the, the rational part of it, but you've, you have this feeling that you shouldn't go that place, or you have this feeling that this person is, is not right for you, but you don't have facts. Intuition. There's a, this book that explains what, what, what happens with intuition. In, and, and what this book says is that in the, in the right brain, there are things that happen faster than in the left brain. Because it's like, a, it's like a processing speed. Your brain that has different velocities or speeds of processing information. So what happens when the part of your brain that makes sense of the world is a little slower than one part of the brain that gets information, process it, and then send it to the other one. Well, the, the left brain doesn't know what to do with that information. So it, it discards it. It says it's intuition, and don't, don't make decisions based on intuition. And really what is happening in your brain is that one part of the brain is acting faster than the rest. The only thing is we don't know what to do with that information. I not only believe that there's this huge revolution coming, but I'm sure that is already happening. And these are some of the gurus on different industries. And this is probably one of the reasons why I'm sure that this is already happening, this new revolution. It's, it almost doesn't matter what industry you go, if you read a book of whoever is the most avant-garde thinker of that industry, deeply, deeply in the text, he's going to be talking about the same things. And this is some examples. Daniel Pink, for example, his, his book, he has a few books, but one of his latest books is Drive. And basically what he says is that we have been motivating people in, in the wrong way. Because motiva motivation is external, and we should be focusing on drive that is internal. Motivation lasts very little, and drive can last a lifetime. So his explanation is, in the industry, in the factory, many times that it did make sense to motivate externally. But when you come to, to, to the world we live today, that doesn't work anymore. So he's basically talking about passion. 
something that is in the, in, the, in, in the right brain, not in the left brain. Michael Gladwell, that probably you know, he has a few books, Tipping Point, uh, Outliers, and so on. And in Outliers, he, he tried to explain the, 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 the reasons of success. And at the, at the end, the conclusion is, is, is goes again that people that is successful is because they have passion, basically. It's, a book this big, but at the end you can, you can resume that that is because they had passion. And you don't find passion in the left brain again. You ha find passion in the right brain, the one that had, we have been told not to use. Marc Goubet, and this is, this is interesting, Marc Goubet started 15 years ago, a little more, with a theory that then uh, Martin Lindstrom proved that it was real. But Marc Goubet, what he said is that today nobody buys products or services, and this applies to everything. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're an architect, if you're a designer, nobody's really gonna buy your design. Nobody's really gonna buy your services. What people buy is, is experiences through uh, emotions. And the future is gonna be basically whoever is gonna be able to transmit emotions and build successful ex experiences is the people that's gonna be successful. And that's basically what it does Apple, and that's what it, that, that's the difference, for example, between BMW and Audi. The two cars, basically, they do the same. But in BMW, you have the experience of driving. And they, they do specific things in the car, so you have that experience. In the C4, for example, they, they make a hole in, in the chassis, so you actually can hear more the noise of the, of the, of the engine. Because the noise of the engine was not enough to, to complete the experience of driving a, a, a sport car. So they decided to make a hole so you can listen it to the, to the noise. Well, that's, that's emotions and that's experiences. But Michael Bay presented it as a, as a theory. A few years ago came Martin Lindstrom, okay, that is, uh, according to Time Magazine, one of the 100 more uh, influential people in, in, in the planet, I, I think it was like two, two years ago. And what he did is, is the most amazing study related with uh, purchasing decisions. He did the biggest MRI study in the world to find out what's happening in your brain when you make purchasing decisions. And it's amazing what the, the result that he has. The, the first one is 70% of the components <coughs> of almost any type of decision, they come from part of your brain that you don't control. So this idea that we were told for many years, don't make emotional decisions, make rational decisions, even if we wanted to, doesn't happen. We can't. The brain just doesn't work that way. And it's proven in a lab. 2,000 people went to this MRI study. The second interesting thing of this, and it's, this is not part of the book, but it's the, the, the first conclusion that you came once that you read the book, the brain doesn't know what is taking decision of. I mean, if you go and buy a, a cell phone, you, we, you don't have a phone that is designed to buy cell phones. You just have a brain. You, you don't have a brain specifically when you're gonna buy a car and it, that works in a certain way because you're buying a car. Everything that's around us, it becomes electricity in, your, in our brain and it moves around. And it's, the electricity is not, it doesn't have a little sticker that says cell phone, house, car. It's just electricity that is was transformed in, in your brain and it goes to wherever it wants. So this MRI study applies to everything. Applies to how you fall in love. Applies to how you understand architecture. Applies to interior design, applies to objects, applies to almost everything because the brain doesn't know that it's one object or another one. For the brain, it's just electricity going places. Now, one of the biggest challenges that I believe we have uh, as, as, as a design industry is that I haven't heard that many people doing MRIs to understand what happens in the brain in a cellular level with this type of lighting, with a different type of lighting. When you sit down in the floor, when you are standing up, when you move, it's gotta be happening something. 
you, you want to create, you want to design empathic spaces, well, I'm sure that there are things that happen in the space that, that detonate the part of the brain that makes you empathic. But we don't know yet. And we are far because there, the rest of the industries in the world, they are doing this type of studies to understand how the brain works. Then there's this guy, Ken Robinson, the one I was talking about, uh, that, uh, it, talking about the education. And, and at the end, he's talking about the same things. It's like the, the, most, the two most important things that the, the, the education system should be doing, normally, is the last things that they're doing. The, the two most important things that the, the educational system should be doing is trying to help you find what are you good at and trying to find your passion. And I don't know uh, in your experience, but at least in my experience, in the educational system that I was raised, nobody even talked about it. Nobody mentioned passion at, at all. Maybe when I got to the architectural school, but it was not it was not something delivered. Uh, it was not part of the system to try to, we didn't have a class on passion. Now you're gonna have from nine to 10, your passion class. And we're gonna try to figure out what the hell makes you move. Nobody asked that, those questions in the, the educational system. So the only people that happened to me, I don't even know why I ended up being an architect. And I found my passion, and I believe that I live in this magical place called the element. But it was not because somebody did a system that helped me get there. It was because I met somebody by chance that he was a very good uh, graphic designer, and then I decided I didn't like that, and my father was an engineer. I didn't like that either, but I thought, well, if you mix these two things, I ended up designing architectural because of chance and not because the system was designed to help me get there. Then there's David Kelly, that is the, he, I'm sure you, you, you know David Kelly from IDEO. And, and I, not only IDEO, he, he influenced uh, the D school in Stanford. And something interesting is that it's, it's one of the first design schools for non-designers. So somebody figured out that designers have something special that nobody else has, that you could teach to the rest of the world and make them better lawyers, accountants, doctors, or whatever. And they do things like, for example, they teach lawyers to do prototyping. And the interesting part of, the, uh, of doing that is, is that when you do prototyping, normally 90% of the problems for, for almost all the industries are mental problems, intellectual problems are problems that you solve in your mind. Designers, we have like real problems that you do a model, and, and they, they have to become real. But if you're an, a lawyer, all your problems are intellectual problems. If you're an accountant, your problems are an accounting problems that happen in the brain, and they get solved in the brain. And basically the theory is that if you are able to make these people that normally were using their brain to solve the problems, you make them do prototyping, you literally, what you do is take the idea for a ride. You take the idea from the brain through parts of, of the brain to get it out, build something, and then your idea is gonna come back to your brain through other places. So you actually take your idea and, and for a ride around your brain, outside your brain, and then again, and that gives you a lot of information and gives you a lot of, of creativity to solve your problems. So one of the things that, uh, that this school in Stanford is focusing in is he helping people to understand the importance of prototyping. And then Janine Venus, that I'm sure that you have here about Janine, uh, biomimicry, this methodology where you mix biology and, and design. And basically the theory is that the, the nature has solved every single problem design problem that there is. The challenge is that designers, we don't know anything about nature or biology, and we don't care. So we ended up normally designing and solving problems in a very different way of, of the way that nature will have solved those problems. The only way that Janine can, and every single of these guys 
can be talking about the, what they're talking about is that the world already changed. Because everything, what they're talking about, they, they're, everything mixed in the, in the right brain. Nothing is, is not, none, of, none of the things that they're talking about is in the left brain. Everything happens, what they're talking about, in the right brain. You cannot mix biology and design in the left brain. Because that's not the way it works, the left brain. The left brain needs to, to have everything in a very little box. Because it, the, the capacity of synthesizing is in the right brain, it's not in the left brain. So that's one of the reasons why the, the educational system and everything in the world as we know it has been compared to Malad, well, put into little boxes. Basically is because that's the way left brain makes sense of the world. So breaking these little boxes and mixing these little boxes, that doesn't happen in the left brain. I believe that there are today outside things happening that can somehow demonstrate that this huge revolution is going on. And I call it micro migrations. Before the huge migration from one side to the other, I believe that there are happening these little things that couldn't happen 15 years ago. And I call them micro migrations. And, and again, as, I mean, this, it doesn't exist, the term micro migration. I just made it up for the lecture and tried to make sense of what I was thinking. But for example, open source and closed source. And a good example of this is, I don't know exactly how many years ago, but when Encarta, when, when uh, Encarta started uh, the, the encyclopedia for, for Microsoft, it was basically at the same time as, as the, the other one, what's the name of the one they used all the time? It's, uh, Wikipedia. At the same time that Wikipedia started, uh, Encarta started. And Encarta was the, the, the encyclopedia founded by Microsoft with money, with real of offices. And basically the most important thing in that moment, what Microsoft thought is, who in the world is gonna go to a resource that you don't even know if it's real what they are saying? And basically that's Wikipedia. I mean, nobody really knows that what you are reading in Wikipedia is actually real or true. But nobody really cares anymore here today, so it doesn't really matter. But in that moment, Microsoft said, well, these guys are gonna fail. Nobody's going to be in a new university and it's going to use as a resource Wikipedia. A hippie in the garage of his pa parents with a computer writing uh, an encyclopedia, who's going to use that? And a few years later, Encarta got bankruptcy and they closed it and, and Wikipedia is the, the, the most used resource in any university in the world. If you try to explain that to the logical brain, that doesn't make sense. If you try to explain that to, to my father, he doesn't just understand it. And that's one of the micro-migration. Mic the micro-migration is when, it's, when something is happening that doesn't make sense in a logical world, it's because something happened and jumped it already to the other side of the, of the brain. And there are many examples of that. Uh, social learning done against traditional learning, for example. There's a huge study in Europe that tries to, to demonstrate that between 50 and 70% of what you're going to learn in your life, you're going to learn it in a social environment, not in a formal environment. And if you look around schools and if you look around uh, offices, everything is built around the formal education and the formal ambience. There's very little universities that 50% of the university is social environments. I, I haven't found a single one. Stanford is doing things like that, but they probably have 20% of the space or 30% of the space. But if 70% of what you're going to learn comes from social environments, we have been building schools, designing schools for 150 years in, in a very wrong way. What's going to happen with these micro-migrations? We're going to have to develop new skills. Skills as a society, as, as, as countries, as people, and skills that normally we don't have. 
we're going to have to to be empathic for example empathy is going to be probably one of the biggest uh, commodities in the world uh, we're going to have to learn to, to to teach and learn on social environments we have to we're going to have to jump into so social responsibility we're going to have to start talking more about experiences and emotions instead of objects or spaces but there's a good thing on this and a challenge this is our design revolution the only group of people that has been talking about this they have been learning about these new skills they have been been trained about these things normally are designers if you're not empathic you're you, you're not going to be a good designer because you keep solving problems for somebody else uh, the only people that has been knowing how to do prototyping are, are designers architects and so on I believe that what is happening right now is going to force the designers to understand that design is not about objects or spaces, but it's about understanding the world in a different way. Understanding that, that, that the world needs creative solutions, then they're going, to have, they're going to have to come from the design industry. If we really want to change the world as we know it, if we want to reduce poverty in the world, if we want to bring water to the kids in Africa that don't have water, if we want to really transform the world, the biggest problems we have as a society today are not going to be solved by left-brainers. Those problems are going to have to be solved by right-brainers. Those problems are going to have to be solved by designers. So we have, in one hand, we have a huge opportunity because now the world for designers is, is going to be huge. I mean, countries are going to have to start doing uh, public policy with a design view. Uh, companies are going to start hiring designers to run the companies, not only to run the design department, but to run the whole company. That is basically what Steve Jobs did. Steve Jobs was a designer. All his obsessions ab ab about the shape, the textile, the, 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 the feeling of the object, uh, the empathy on, on how to use it, all those things were design obsessions. They were not engineer obsessions, they were not marketing obsessions, they were design obsessions. And I believe that the future is going to be, the, the, the design companies are going to be the, 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 the future of the, of the companies. When I came back from the lecture, well, the lecture in Taipei, they, they did it to close the, the, the Congress. Uh, and basically because it was uh, like, a, like a resume of all the things that they, they were talking about. And since then, I started looking around and I started noticing that, that design started to be in the middle of everything. It's in books, in magazines, in texts, in a lot of things. But the problem is that probably the, the only group of people that is still doesn't understand that design is not about the spaces and objects, but it's this magical glass that we have, are the designers. What I, what I started to notice in is that the designers were the only ones that were not understanding the real potential that we have to transform the world. And it's not only, it's not only a, an opportunity, but it's a responsibility. If we don't do it as designers, nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to be able to solve poverty in the world if it's not the people that is on creative, innovative, uh, and thinking in the right, right side of the brain. Nobody is going to be able to, to, to reduce uh, poverty or bring water to the, to, the, to the kids in Africa and so on. To solve the biggest problems today in the world, we need designers to start thinking beyond the objects and spaces. And that's where you're going to have to see uh, uh, some of the work that I, that I do. I believe that myself, my company is a micro-migration. We have, we have offices in Japan, India. We started in the United States, but we ended up selling the operations. We, we have offices in Mexico, and currently we're doing projects from Brazil, Colombia, Panama, uh, a few things in Europe. And if every time that I talk to an MBA, my brother is an MBA, accountant and then MBA, I'm, I always make the joke that either he is adopted or I'm adopted. 
and I'm getting the conclusion that I'm the adopted. But every time that I talk to my brother, he doesn't understand how we do business. I don't know anything about admin or administration or all the things that he wants to know. He always is like, well, what, what's your return of investment? And I'm what? <laughs> I just want to design. And he's like, well, you have to know your know, numbers and if like, what I told him, what I always tell him is that, imagine that I have a hot dog little car outside a uh, bar. And I sell hot dogs. The only thing I need to know is how much my hot dog costs and how much I sell it. That's it. <laughs> Everything else, it, I don't care. I mean, the difference between how much it costs and how much I sell it is the money that I'm going to put into my pocket and I'm going to go back to my home with. Well, maybe I have to pay taxes, but <laughs> that's part of, to me, that's part of the cost of the hot dog. So at the end, it's, it's, I believe that my company is a micro-migration. My company doesn't make sense for, for the logical world. Doesn't make sense at all. I, the people that work with me, they, I'm not their father, so they can get to the office whenever they want. There are no hierarchies, so we don't have private offices. We all are in, 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 a, in a studio, very similar to what you can find uh, here. Uh, everybody's free to do whatever they want, as long as they produce what they have to produce. And, and I believe that they are grown-ups and they are responsible. And they're happy, so that's important. And these are some examples of what we do. As, as Javier said, we started doing mainly corporate interiors. Uh, my concern is that uh, a lot of the things that we do, basically, they help my clients to make more money, sadly. But I decided to do it being corporate. I love corporate. I, uh, I like interiors. And basically, the real reason why a lot of companies hire me is because I help them to be more productive, to have people more, more happy, and at the end, that makes them make more money. So what, one of the things that I decided is that uh, I was going to do that as long as I was not damaging the planet. So we decided to do green projects since the beginning with everything we do. So all our projects are sustainable. We, we did a methodology that, depending on the type of the project, is, is more green than one could be more green than another one. But, but we do a lot of the lead certification pro process in every single project that, that we do. This is Microsoft in Brazil, and this is the, the biggest, one of the biggest training centers that Microsoft has in the world, and they don't have auditoriums, they don't have uh, traditional r classrooms. Uh, we figure out that the, the, the technology should be taught in a social environment. So this is a huge bar with a cafe, with a ping pong table, and it's, it's like a club. And, and has been very successful because people learn technology much faster when they are relaxed talking to a friend than when you are in a classroom trying to figure out what the hell is the guy in front of you telling you. This is an airline, this is Volaris. And what is interesting about this one is that we did it with garbage. They didn't have a budget, but they had a lot of things in, in a storage that basically was garbage for them. So wheels and this, these are real part of the one plane that, that broke, so they, they had it over there. So what I said is like, well, if you let me go to the, your storage and take whatever I want, I can make your office with that, and, and we'll be very happy. And t right now, this, is, this project is competing for, for an award in, in England for intelligent design, because basically, it's, an, it's a different way of doing sustainable design. Because we recycle almost everything, but not in the traditional way of recycling that you have to put energy, and you have to transform the object into something else. We just took what we found and make something else. This is a publishing company and uh, something that, that I love books and I'm, uh, I'm an addict to, to, to buy books in Amazon. I, I wish I could read as fast as I buy. <laughs> but in, in, when, when we went to this publishing company, what, something that I noticed is that 
once that the publishing company uses and produce the book, it becomes into garbage almost. They don't know what to do with it. I mean, they, they went through the process of putting together the book, and then they start stacking the books in boxes and, and because they don't use it anymore in the business. So I'm, I'm very concerned of, of how the physical environment tells a story. And we're built, I'm, I'm convinced that we are built around storytelling. And I don't know if you are in classes talking about storytelling, but I, I have right now this obsession on storytelling that I, I hire in my studio, I hire a PhD on literature, and basically to, to teach us how to tell stories. And it's been amazing. I mean, and this is part of the, the micro-migrations that we're gonna start seeing we're going to have to start working with people that normally you wouldn't be working. And this guy, is, he's a literature teacher on, uh, for PhDs. And when I heard him, he was like, I don't understand what you want me. And I'm like, well, architectural interiors should be telling stories. And we tell stories. The problem is that we, we don't have a clue how to put together a story. I mean, if you really want to know how to put together a story, you have to actually study how to story tell. I mean, you just don't, don't go and write a novel just like that. So I said, well, I want to know how you write a novel. I'm not going to, I'm not going to write the novel, but I'm going to do design. And if I understand how the, the, the mind works with storytelling and how you should be able to put together a story, then I can, instead of using words, start using objects, design, colors, shapes, or whatever. So it has been very interesting because half, half of what he talks about, we don't, have, we don't understand. But what we did here, and, and I'm very concerned about the stories that your spaces tell. And, and the story that this space was telling with the books all over the place, it was a very bad story. It's a story that, that tells you that you really don't care about the books, that you are just making money with the books, but the, it's not about the books. So we wanted to make it about the books, to, to try to find the drive, the passion on the people that work in that space. So what you see here is the reception, and it's, these are books that for some reason had a mistake or something like that, they were gonna be destroyed. And there are 11,000 books that, that we created uh, uh, as part of the design and architecture. So instead of using drywall in many places, we started to use books. And, and, and we started to build walls with, with books. So the book became part of the architecture and the design and became the, something fundamental. This is BASF. This, this, this project has been uh, awarded in, in England, in Italy, and in, in Mexico. It's a building that has like 40 years old and we did a major renovation. And uh, what is interesting is this, this is part of what, what uh, Javier was saying, that, that we started to design buildings being interior designers. And, and basically because many of the clients understood that what you really want from a building is not the building, it's interior. So in, that, in one extreme, I'm not, I'm not even sure if, if architecture really exists. I know that exists, I know that is there, but, it, but it's, I don't know if it was Kant, one of these philosophers said that if you don't leave it, does it exist? I mean, if you don't leave something, I mean, you don't leave architecture. When you're outside, it's urban design, landscape, and it's the, con the, con the consumption of the, 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 the few buildings that you leave. But it's not the building the one you leave. And when you're inside, what you leave in is interiors. So if you don't leave the architecture, does it really exist? And obviously it exists, and I know that in a very basic answer is yes, it, it exists, it has material and it's there. But we have been obsessed with, with the envelope without really understanding that what people really want is, is what's happening inside of the envelope. And the envelope should be really related to what's going on inside. My theory is that what is going on inside should be driving what is going on on the envelope. So we started to do this methodology that we designed from the inside out. So we designed the interiors and once that we have the interiors, we start putting the, the envelope on top of the interiors. 
And that, I believe, that is a micro-migration itself, because this is the opposite way that normally architects do. And in some point, I, I don't know why, interior design and architectural separated. And what, what we're trying to do is try to, to link them together. The building on the left on the top is, is one in the, that is, is going to start construction in China uh, very soon. It's a mixed use. Uh, the other ones are either in Mexico City, this one, um, or the other ones in Monterey. And, and all of them are the result of designing the interior. And once that you have the interior, just put in a, an envelope. And the idea of the envelope is that protects the interior from the environment, making it sustainable that way. So finally, I want to welcome to Design Revolution. Um, I want to tell you that, that I'm very excited because I think that in, in, in many thousands of years, designers were left behind, or the, these type of people either die crazy, alone, poor, and I think that that's about to change. I really believe that the next huge revolution that is happening right now is going to be about design. Now, my biggest concern is that I'm not sure that designers are getting it. And if we don't get it, somebody else will. Thank you very much. I don't know if somebody has a question, comment. How do you tailor your uh, speech to uh, about outsourcing to Chinese audience? Chinese audience? No, the, uh, uh, Chinese. Uh, the the problem is, for example, countries like Mexico, uh, because Chinese they know that they are outsourcing and they are doing they are fine with that and they have a strategy that they're going to stop outsourcing very soon, but. The problem is more countries that they haven't figured out if they're going to be in one side or the other. Chinese are okay with outsourcing and they're making a lot of money. But they, they know that they are in that side and they are, they are doing it well. Uh, the problem is with the countries that they are in the middle. Mexico is one of those, for example. We are not cheap enough to be outsourcing or to be the RCC. And we are not spending enough into innovation, creativity, and, and, and making the other part. So that's the worst scenario. If you're in one side and you really are in that side, that's fine. You're going to be doing well. Now, China is it, the, one of the reasons why China did this Congress in Taipei is because they, they want to transform Taipei in the capital of design of the world in a different way of understanding design. They don't, they don't want to. <laughs> put a lot of design stores in, in Taipei and, and, and have nice landscape in the city. They want to have somebody run in the city with a design mind. That is going to be, that, that, that is that's different just to put stores than actually approach with a design approach. So they know where they are and they, but they're doing a lot of things to change it. This isn't necessarily along the lines of philosophical, but uh, how did you get away? How did you uh, address the fire code issue with the books in the ceiling and such? You, how did you fireproof those books? Uh, we have the sprinklers uh, uh, in, in as part of the uh, as part of the ceiling, and we coated all the books with the uh, fire protection material. And besides, in Mexico, we don't have, we don't have uh, uh, norms that are strict, so <laughs> you, you, can, you, you can do much more things than in other places. But we did, we did things, so, so we, we didn't have a fire hazard. We're starting to be aware of all these different uh, changes and, and and things that we need to do, responsibilities, I guess. How would you suggest, or what will be a, I guess, yeah, more like a suggestion of how, how are we, we going to be dealing with those other three or four different generations working with them? Not to get frustrated or, you know, trying to make a change, 
if we're entering the workspace as like the very smallest one, I guess, the smallest um, element on that, on that. I think that, well, one of the biggest challenges I, I, I believe in, in my little theory that works for me, I mean, sometimes I, I have the feeling that Virgin Mary came in, in a dream and told me, go and spread the world. I, because sometimes it feels like I'm talking about a new religion, but I think that many of the corporations, uh, as, as, as we know it, they're going to either change dramatically or just disappear. For example, I don't, I don't think that the huge design firms are going to be able to stand long, for a long time. The HOKs, the, the, those the Gensler's. It's going to take a while because they're huge. But for example, in Mexico, the, we kick their ass. And, and, and I have an alliance, a design alliance. The thing is that the way you, you put together HOK is the way you put together an army before the Industrial Revolution. The rules, the, the jerky, the way of setting up that makes more sense if you are in a, in a war saving your life than if you want to be creative in an environment in, in any city today. So it has like 200 years of difference to, to, to reality today. The alliance that we have that put, put together, uh, what I've been doing is I've been traveling around the world putting, putting together a design alliance that's called IDEA. And, and what, it, what I wanted to do was to, to, to have the, the, the most talented group of uh, uh, interior designers specialize on corporate around the world. We are 5,000 people in this alliance. We're bigger than any bigger firm in the world. We're faster because the companies that are in this alliance are, are the size of my company. We are not huge. We are big enough to handle any type of project, but we are not a few thousands that takes a, a lot to make decisions. So if we keep uh, analyzing the world with the left brain, we're going to keep going to the same conclusions. And the same conclusion is that you have to go and start in a huge HOK company, and you're going to be drawing restrooms for 10 years, and then maybe you're going to jump into the drawing uh, meeting rooms and I don't think that's going to be the future very soon. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. So I believe that, I don't know if you have here about co-working. In Europe it's everywhere, but the, the, in Europe is, you find these spaces that, that creative people get together. And you pay like a fee, like if you're going to a gym, and you can use a space to work, and you can find designers, graphic designers, and, and you can find a lot of talent over there and go and, and, and win a, a design competition without having to put together a company. You just get the talent together, go for the, for the competition, win the competition, and maybe you don't even stick together. Maybe you move on to the next thing. So m my recommendation will be don't think that the only solution outside there is the corporate world getting and starting from below and trying to jump into the ladder, because I believe that that is going to last very little. Now it's not going to be easy. They are huge and and they're going to stay around a while. But I think that there are there are many new ways of doing things. I want to go, before I answer the question, I want to go back to the, uh, the question that I did at the beginning. Why I think happened to the car industry is that the car industry in the 60s was run by designers. Shelby, Porsche, Pininfarina, you name it. All the, all, all the cars that you see on the 60s, they were the, the company was run by a designer. And then today the companies are run by, by admin people, by engineers, by everybody else, but not designers. So I think that what is going to start happening is that designers are going to start 
taking leadership positions in companies. And that is going to be a completely different approach. To begin with, we're going to be more empathic with the people that work with, for us, for example. And, and we are going to understand that, that, that design matters and that design is a good business. The problem today is that designers are at the last part of the chain. So if you go to the car industry, there's going to be an engineer or a bunch of engineers that are going to decide how the car is going to be. Then there's going to be a lot of regulation that's going to say that the, you, you cannot have an engine bigger than something because you're going to pollute and the petroleum or whatever. And there's going to be these 50 people taking decisions on how the car is going to be. And then they, they're going to give it to the designer and they're going to tell them, what color do I paint the car? The most creative people in the whole chain, the only one trained to see the big picture, to be empathic, to, to do all the things that you need to be creative, is the, that one. It's the one that they went to ask, what color do I paint the car? So I, what I believe is going to happen is that we're going to start taking leadership positions in many industries, not necessarily in design industries and construction industries. We have to go to other industries. One of the, th the, 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 the biggest reasons is that we are the only ones that, that know that failure is part of the process. And I have hearing a lot of leaders on business saying that you have to learn from failure. But that's, sorry, but that's bullshit. Failure has to be part of the process. You don't have to learn from failure. You have to build it into your process because it makes two things. First, you, if it's part of the process, you don't even question that you have to learn or not. It's part of the process, you will learn. But the most important one is that one that, that failure is part of the process, you're not afraid. You're not afraid to, of failing because you control it, you, you, you love it, it's part of what you do. And that's what we need for real innovation. If companies want to innovate really, they need somebody leading the company that is not afraid of failure. And the only way not to be afraid of failure is to fail every day. Otherwise, you're going to be very afraid. And designers, if you ask any, any designer, whatever you're going to design is going to work the first, the first piece that you'd make, of course not. You, you're going to be crazy to say, yeah, I'm going to create the, the, a new phone that doesn't exist, and the first one I do is going to be perfect. But if you go with the rest of the industries, th they think that way. Economists, they think that way, and that's why we are where we are in, in, in the crisis. Why we have been destroying the world as we have been destroying the world? Because the people that is leading the companies the societies, the countries, they don't have an empathic training. If you are an engineer, two plus two is four. If two is lonely, I like very much two, it doesn't matter, it's gonna be four. Oh, but the two is very lonely, it's gonna be four. When you're a designer, if somebody is lonely, it matters. You're going to be empathic when you're a designer. And the only way to, to actually care about the environment and the next generations is to be really empathic. We are not going to change the, 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 the way we are destroying the world until, um, until empathic people or people with empathic training start making the, the important decisions. I don't know if that's a very long answer. <laughs> Thank uh, Juan Carlos again.